Good afternoon. It is a great, great honor to be introducing an old friend. In 2015, he was awarded the Rolex National Geographic Explorer of the Year along with Innocent. Now, Emmanuel Demerode and I met each other when we were doing our PhDs, and he mistakenly hired me at the end of my PhD to go out with him to Gabon study gorillas. And when I arrived, he was out there in a cold sweat, suffering from malaria. And uh, I woke up in the morning, and he was gone. And I thought, where's Emmanuel? And they said, oh, he's out taking the tourists into the forests. And he was doing whatever it took to really make that operation work. And it gives you insight to Emmanuel's character. From there, he went on, and he started a thing called Wildlife Direct. And it was a really innovative project of its time. It was taking the global community and connecting them to people on the ground and providing resources to people who were actually being successful. And you could see through the blogging world what they were doing, so there was a direct connection. He then went on to uh, become the director of Virunga National Park, and that was in 2008. Now, Virunga is a stunning place. For those of you who've been there, it needs no explanation. It's one of the most diverse places. It's the first national park in Africa. It's also a World Heritage Site, but it's also a really difficult place to work. Um, since Emmanuel started in 2008, he's lost 50 staff. There's been 170 people that have died serving, over 170 people who have died serving uh, Virunga National Park. And in this past year, this past 12 months, he's lost 16 people. Now, each one of these people are, are colleagues and friends. Um, so it's been extremely difficult. But Emmanuel has also made personal sacrifices as well and uh, has been shot multiple times uh, while trying to do his job. He's dealing with multiple threats. He's dealing with, with all sorts of different militia groups. He's dealing with illegal charcoal burners. And some of you may have seen the film Virunga, and you see that he's also dealing with some rogue oil companies. But when Emmanuel came in 2008, he brought hope. He's brought many, many jobs to the region. He's empowered the communities. He's brought security. And the gorillas of the region, which are globally famous, have gone from 600 to 1,000. But this past year has been very, very difficult. Emmanuel, we're grateful for your work, and we're so grateful that you spent the time to come be here with us. Emmanuel Demerode. So, Emmanuel, I want to start by just um, having everyone understand how you connected with this region, how, how you first discovered Virunga, and how it found a place really in your heart. Thanks, Jonathan, and, and thanks for sort of bringing me in at the last minute. Um, it's often the way it is. Um, you know, we're, we're in, in you know, very um, particular circumstances at the moment, trying to deal with all sorts of issues, and um, it's, it's good to be here and to feel to feel supported. Um, for me, the, the story um, goes back a long way. I was very fortunate to grow up in Kenya um, and to be in that environment that inspires you with respect to these extraordinary areas in, in Africa. And one place that really stood out as a child was this magical place in the middle of, um, in the, middle of the Congo um, that had these incredibly high mountains and this incredible wildlife. And so um, I, I um, I had this always at the back of my mind. And I remember my parents telling me that, you know, that, that that one species that's so emblematic of this place, which is the mountain gorillas, was a species that I would never see when I grow up. Um, and of course, this was in, in the early 80s when Diane Fossey was there, when she was killed, and when the outlook looked so bleak um, for the species. And so um, many years later, um, when I had finished my studies, I bought a motorbike in Uganda and just rode across um, Uganda into Congo and, and just came across this incredibly um, magical, this incredibly spectacular place, um, you know, with its, its 17,000 foot mountains and its incredible savannas and tropical rainforests and so on. But really what kept me there were the, um, were the people, this incredible team of, of rangers um, with whom 
I've now spent the last 25 years. Um, and so um, that's, that's really it. That's, the, um, that, that's been our, our, our story in Virunga. And can you tell us about um, the Virunga Alliance and mm. how you've really brought a whole raft of opportunities in and around the park? Um, so the Virunga Alliance was um, this attempt, which in some ways um, started in this building. Um, it, it, it emanated from um, a, a very, very difficult period that we experienced in 2007 um, and was actually the subject of a, um, a National Geographic magazine. It was a front cover issue when all the, the mountain gorillas were being killed. And for about a year, we, um, we were confronted with this problem that we just couldn't understand. You know, these gorillas were being killed. They weren't being killed for their meat or for the baby gorillas. And over that year that followed during the investigations, we came to realize that it was more to do with their habitat and more to do with a much, much bigger problem um, against which conservation was being confronted, which was really an economic problem, a problem relating to the four million people who live in extreme poverty around the park. And because they're living in extreme poverty amidst such affluence, Congo is a country that is perhaps the richest on earth and yet has the poorest population. Um, that creates uh, an enormous problem of social injustice. And where you have social injustice, you have violence. Um, and it really tied to the fact that people desperately need resources. In the case of the mountain gorillas, they need charcoal to cook, they need charcoal to survive. And so they were trying to access the forest. To access the forest, they were working with the militias. And the militias were killing the gorillas to, um, to discourage Virunga's rangers from protecting that forest. And so it was really that year um, when, um, partly through this National Geographic article, that it was really blown um, into a global issue um, that we, we came to realize that we needed to confront this. And when you're a conservationist, you, the first thing you must do is to acknowledge your limitations. You know, we, we, we live in a world which, which is moving so fast, where the forces are so great, that really as conservationists, as a very sort of defensive group of people, we're very limited in what we can do. And so we, we, we try to adjust that by building friendships, by building partnerships, um, and out of that came this idea of the Virunga Alliance, which was an attempt to work with all those basic um, elements that make up society, so the government. Um, that's when I joined public service. I became a park warden. I became a ranger. Um, but also working with civil society, you know, those, all those incredible people who are trying to change their own lives living around the park. And then, of course, with the private sector, which is what drives change more than anything and bringing those three things together to develop tourism, to develop energy, an alternative form of energy from the very destructive charcoal, but also from things like illegal oil extraction in the park. And then finally, um, the transformation of Congo's resources by the Congolese people through agricultural transformation. And that's now become a $100 million investment around the park. And what's really interesting is that with this provision of energy, so hydropower from the park's forests, um, we're, we're able to power industry and through that create jobs. And um, for every megawatt of electricity, we're talking about 100 megawatts here, creating 800 to 1,000 jobs, of which 800 to 1,000 jobs per megawatt, so a total of close to 100,000 jobs, of which 9.6% now are from these militia groups. So you're getting this very sort of positive transfer from the militias to gainful employment. And so that's really what the Virunga Alliance is, is to try and engage with a much yeah. broader group of people. So you've built it out. Manuel's built this amazing ecotourism infrastructure, and I've experienced it myself. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, building the large energy projects, bringing jobs, and looking at sustainable fisheries. But this last year has been really tough. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the challenges you've been facing? Yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's really important to look at, um, 
you know, th these protected area projects, and we're hearing a lot about them today as, um, you know, within a, a, a realistic framework. You know, they you know, we've always um, come, you know, we've always been clear about the fact that to restore these very fragile ecosystems, um, it can take 20 to 30 years, but to destroy them can be done in three days. Um, and that's really what we're dealing with. It takes an incredible level of commitment. And over those long extended periods, you, you go through some pretty tough patches. You know, you go through some, some very, very difficult moments. Um, and you do get this, this terrible thing that park managers are faced with, which is um, service deaths among their staff. And this is really what we've been experiencing recently um, is a, a, a horrific loss of life because of the upsurge in violence in, in the region. Um, it's something that can be confronted over a long time period, um, but which has gotten extremely difficult in the last, in the last few weeks. We, um, we've lost 16 staff in the, in the last 12 months, eight of which has been in, in the last month and a half. Um, and the, the um, you know, the, the, the prospects look like it's going to get worse before it gets better. Um, what's remarkable, remarkable, though, is the unflinching commitment um, of the 700 rangers who continue to protect the park in spite of the loss of their colleagues. So it really is a, um, possibly the most difficult moment we've faced, um, but it's certainly not a moment where anyone feels like, like giving up. Emmanuel, we want to support you in any way, and National Geographic wants to contribute 100,000 to go towards the Rangers. But what can we do more broadly to, to support you? Um, I think it's just keeping, you know, keeping, keeping an eye on what's happening um, in Virunga. And it's not just Virunga. Um, there are other sites like it where you've got um, isolated staff on the ground um, who you know, who are trying their utmost, who are prepared to sacrifice everything um, to see through their, their duty, um, and often go unnoticed. I, I get asked, um, as I have today, how many rangers have died in Virunga since the war started in 98? And the, the answer is, I, I don't know, um, because um, there was a period of about five years where rangers were going, getting killed protecting the wildlife without anybody knowing about it and, and, and disappearing in the forest unrecorded. And this really has to stop. And I think that that really is a role that National Geographic can play. That is their natural role, is to draw attention to those who get it least and who do the most to keep, keep these, these amazing places going. Well, Emmanuel, we have to end there. Um, Emmanuel will be here for the rest of the day. So if any of you have questions, I'm sure he'd be more than happy to take them. But we're so grateful for you coming here. We're um, just humbled by what you do. And um, we wish you all the luck and support going forward. Thank you. Thanks ever so much. Mm -hmm.